Coming up on the AXA Legislative Lunch Break, Edgar and I will get you all of your latest news and information from the state capitol and CDE with an in-depth analysis of how it's impacting your school community. Plus, we'll talk about the changing dynamic in California public schools and the relationships between management and labor and what that means for your school community. Naj, the AXA Legislative Lunch Break starts now. And we're a couple of minutes after one o'clock. Welcome on a Wednesday to the AXA Legislative Lunch Break, along with Edgar Zaswata, AXA Senior Director of Policy and Governmental Relations. I'm Naj Alakan, AXA Senior Director of Marketing and Communications. Welcome. We're honored to have you with us after uh, a week off. Go ahead and jump into our chat today. Uh, say hello. Let us know what's happening in your region. Edgar, how are you today? Well, Naj, first, I'm, I'm going to show you how dedicated I am to this okay. show. Even though you gave me the week off last week and right. you, know, you, you didn't say we had the week off, we were relaxing, you know, we had some meetings. So, but good to be back. I made bad planning today. I had a dentist appointment <laughs> right before this show. That's what I heard. I put it in. They were about to drop me as a patient because I keep rescheduling on them. And I got some, you know, I got some injections. I'm a little mm-hmm. numb. So I'm a little self-conscious, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you would have probably called off. I'm, I'm, I'm oh, gonna, don't I'm, you start I'm, with that. I'm going to I'm going to make it through. So I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to be here. Hopefully I don't slobber over myself, but uh, good to be back. Talking you, about. you know what? Now, first off, I would never call off. Second, I feel like I'm going to have to challenge your ability to enunciate and, uh, and, and challenge your diction as we move through this yeah. uh, with some really tough words. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, again, go ahead and jump into our chat. Say hello. Uh, Sheldon Smith, first on there today. Ty Bryson, Lester Powell, uh, good to see all of you today. Ellen Wheeler, our good friend. Angela Shell, uh, Michelle Murphy uh, from Rim of the World uh, School District. Good to have you guys. We're, we're going to cover a couple of topics for you today. Our guests uh, coming up after our uh, news headlines, uh, we're going to talk about labor management, uh, that relationship, what's happening in school communities statewide, what you need to know about how you interact with your school community, and how you confront those challenges with communications. We're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, Edgar, let's go ahead and uh, do some news headlines here. Um, I do want to mention, because you have an update, um, some news towards the effort of expanding vaccinations. What can you tell us? Yeah, we've gotten to the point where if we don't bring it up, somebody's going to ask us, right? So we we almost have to insert it. What's the latest on vaccinations? Nothing new on the school vaccination front, but some interesting developments, which you can make some inferences on uh, in terms of how the politics in the Capitol are around these issues. There there was a a pretty prominent bill uh, by Assemblywoman uh, Wicks from the Bay Area, Buffy Wicks, uh, that had gotten some headlines that was going to require all California businesses and contractors to require their employees to be vaccinated. Uh, I think that coupled with some of the efforts that we've talked uh, at length about relating to schools, we're gonna be some of the most contentious bills of the year. Uh, The assemblywoman just announced just yesterday, I believe it was, that she's not gonna move forward with the bill that's gonna require all California businesses to be vaccinated. And, you know, the, the bottom line, and here is, you know, and the, the, the members might spin it a different way. I don't think the votes were there. I mean, I think that's consistent with what we've been saying on the school vaccination front, yeah. that this is a tough issue politically. So hence the question we're going to, I'm sure we're going to get it. What does this mean for the pan bill? What does this mean for some of the mm-hmm. vaccinate or test efforts? What does it mean for the governor's uh, uh, efforts to try to put in a vaccine requirement? The short answer is nothing technically yet. Right. But I think it does give us somewhat of a vantage point of perspective about what the politics look like. It's tough, even in a state that folks and I think every member that had said that they wouldn't support it or they had some reservations. I think they're coming from the perspective of everybody is saying they're supportive of, of trying to get folks vaccinated. But what is some of the unintended consequences of, of forcing a mandate? So, again, not related to schools, per yeah. se, but. It is, you know, something we're talking about. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Nothing, nothing's changed. We're still planning on having Dr. Pan on this show mm-hmm. here in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. So we will, we will, we will jump right into that that conversation. Yeah, and and, and I'll update um, those of you on that. Marie Russell uh, from Turlock Unified. You can see her uh, her comment right there. Calspers 
uh, communicator of the year. You know, she asked the question, curious how others uh, handling the verify or test for those without insurance. If you have any feedback on that, go ahead and jump in uh, to our chat. A um, couple of other things, Edgar. Um, we are now on day seven of a strike at Sacramento City Unified School District. Uh, this is day five of students that are not in the classroom. Um, uh, details about what is being discussed at the bargaining table, you know, it comes from one side, comes from the other. So, you know, clarity and transparency, you know, al always um, unique. We'll discuss this a little bit further. However, I do want to point out that March has seen labor unrest in a few districts. Um, we had in Rona Park, Katadi, uh, experienced a teacher strike there several days. Uh, there's been some labor unrest in Mount Diablo Unified. Um, you and I both know administrators. We both know teachers. We both know students and families um, that are part of the school community at Sac City Unified. It, it's hard to ignore the reality right now that this is the fifth day that students are not in the classroom. And when you think about the transition from pandemic to endemic, Students are impacted, and now this is day five without them in the classroom. Yeah, I mean, this is a tough one for me. I mean, uh, just, I'm just gonna put the cards out. I'm a, uh, it's 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 personal. I'm a I'm a parent of two two kids at Sac City Unified, so uh, you know they they've been they've been at home. And while I think everybody who's a parent sees this, that from that perspective, you know, the kids the first couple of days they're like, oh, cool, we don't have school, right? Mm -hmm. Then you start realizing kind of what we saw early in the pandemic, and I think that's the unfortunate part. We'll get into. The analysis. I'm going to talk about this just from the kid perspective for a second, yeah. from a parent perspective, right? Uh, that, yeah, after a couple of years of so many interruptions to instruction, of, you know, navigating a really difficult train, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Uh, there's obviously, I think what, one of the conversations we'll have, employees have had a hard time over the last number of years. It's been, we, we've talked about that almost every single week about how challenging it has been to be an educator uh, to be part of the bigger uh, support system for schools, whether it be a certificate employee, classified employee, administrator, everybody has really talked about this as being the most difficult time of their career. Uh, so, yeah, so there's some things obviously that need to be worked out. Unfortunately, yeah, the, one of the repercussions right now is that we have kids out of school. And and I'm as, as a parent, forget, I'll take my AXA hat off for a second. Just as a parent, yeah, I, 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 I keep scrolling, listening to you know, our contacts, talking to our friends, just hoping that this comes to an end here. But some of the bigger issues, that's why I'm excited to have this conversation today with two really leading experts on this front, because I think this goes beyond Sac City Unified. Yeah. As, as you mentioned, this is there seems to be some tensions around the state. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. And Edgar, I want to um, acknowledge, um, you had mentioned this, Maria Thompson, our great board member from Region 15, um, recognizes one of the women of the year in Senator Susan Rubio's district, uh, so congratulations to Maria uh, on that. It's it's well-deserved. Yeah. Maria is such a fantastic uh, school administrator and a member of that community. Not only is she one of the biggest fans here of a like loyal viewer uh, on the legislative run freak, I mean, she puts in a lot of work yeah. for her community, for AXA, one of our leaders. So yeah, very well-deserved to Maria. So congratulations. Okay, I'm going to switch for literally 90 seconds before we bring in our guests to full advertising and promotional mode. I am not going to sound like a used car salesman, but here we go. Um, including today, Edgar and I are going to be doing a version of this show for four times in the next week. Register now for AXA's Legislative Action Days, April 4th and 5th. It's AXA's largest annual advocacy event. We are right now going to put the link for registration in our comment section. You got to register to participate in this free virtual event, April 4th and 5th. Uh, Edgar and I are going to be streaming from 9 until 1130 on both of those days. Um, let me just, because Edgar, I, I have to say, you and the GR team and our Vice President for Legislative Action, Dr. Gina Potter, have put together a lineup of guests um, that is incredible. So let me just read these off for you. Um, Joining us live and interactive during Ledge Action Days, Senator Connie Leva, Assembly Members Kevin McCarty and Patrick O'Donnell, State Superintendent of Public Instruction Tony Thurman, Brooks Allen, the Education Policy Advisor for Governor Newsom, 
Dr. Sohil Sood, who is the co-lead of the Safe Schools for All, Francisco Escobedo from the State Board of Education, Eileen Strauss, former member of the State Board of Education, uh, Kevin Gordon, and former State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Jack O'Connell uh, of Capital Advisors, plus your regional advocacy meetings where you can talk with other lawmakers and staff, tell those stories about what's happening in your school districts. Uh, all of this, register April 4th and 5th. Uh, again, we're on live from 9 until 11.30. Edgar and I, along with Michael Kelly, uh, AXA President Charlie Hoffman, we just mentioned our statewide VPLA, Gina Potter, uh, Mark Ecker will be here, the entire GR staff, so many more. Um, Edgar, this is quite an event. If people aren't registered for this and they're watching this show, shame on you for not being registered for this event. Hey, Naj, if if I even if was if I wasn't already forced to go, you just sold me on on getting there. So you know, <laughs> I, I you know, in all seriousness, uh, we're excited about the lineup. We're excited about some of the guests, but this is an advocacy opportunity. It's not just yeah. an opportunity from he to hear from the experts. It's an opportunity, and this group is not shy. I know our members aren't shy. It's an opportunity to get their perspectives in front of some of the key uh, lawmakers. So it's a lot of the themes that we've been talking about on this show. It's it's going directly to the source. So, yeah, it'll be a good week. It will be a good week. And let me have you guys mark your calendar for two other days. Um, our regularly scheduled AXA legislative lunch break next Wednesday, 1 p.m. here on AXA Facebook and AXA YouTube. Senator John Laird from District 17 was going is scheduled to be with us to talk about legislation inside the Capitol, what's going on uh, with the legislative process. And then also mark your calendar, April 13th, uh, scheduled to appear with us, Dr. Richard Pan, uh, Senator from District 6, will be here to talk about his proposed vaccine legislation. So get ready, folks. We've got some really, really powerful shows coming up. And of course, Legislative Action Day get registered for that. Lester Powell just registered, Edgar C. That's what a little, you got. A little, you got at least, hey, your sales pitch got at least one person. So a little that, power and promotion. That's for sure. Hey, let's go ahead. Let's uh, switch to our topic here about uh, the labor management relationship. We have two guests on uh, the show today. Daniel Connolly is director of management consulting services over at School Services of California. And Terrilyn Fenders, former state trustee uh, who experienced, uh, former school trustee rather, uh, who has experience with the uh, difficult labor negotiations, uh, also from F3 Law. Uh, Danielle and Terlin, it is an honor to have both of you here on the show. I'm going to ask both of you this, this starter question, and, and Danielle, I'll have you start. Um, help us set the stage of what labor relations um, looks like right now around the state. Um, we obviously have some strike profiles like what's happening in Sac City, but there are other, you know, labor issues that have taken place. But, you know, kind of walk us through the trends that you're seeing right now and whether the pandemic has uh, impacted that current environment. So, Danielle, we'll have you start. Great. Thank you. Um, happy to be here during this very cool lunch break, uh, of course, to drop by and talk about labor relations from the statewide perspective. Um, to say the pandemic changed collective bargaining and how LEAs are engaging with their uh, unions um, change things would be an understatement. The past couple of years, though, during the pandemic, during 2020, 2021, we didn't hear a lot about um, negotiations and bargaining, and that's because we normally only hear about things when they aren't going well. So we took a step back from some of the labor disputes that we're seeing now as we march towards impasse proceedings and fact findings um, and some of the job actions such as strikes that you mentioned earlier. So one of the reasons why many LEAs are experiencing difficulties is this intensified focus on compensation. We know that we have uh, received numerous temporary funding sources. And as that relates to ongoing compensation and salaries, that has become um, and emerged as a major topic that has caused some difficulties at the bargaining table because some of us in school business know that you cannot fund ongoing salary increases 
with temporary funding sources, it just doesn't work because those funding sources expire and that's very difficult and complicated um, to explain. The other factor that's impacting many bargaining tables across the state is the staffing shortage and the difficulties that that is causing in terms of the additional resources and support, the substitute shortage, that's a big deal. Um, that's you know the reason why um, we're seeing some of these districts close during the significant strike actions because they cannot keep the schools open due to these um, substitute shortages. So we're seeing that um, on the statewide level, it's a significant change. Um, and we're seeing increasing issues that are rising to the level where we're starting to talk about them um, because negotiations isn't going well. Uh, Terilyn, what about you? What trends are you seeing and what is the impact of the pandemic been like uh, with these relationships? Um, well, uh, well, so thank you for inviting me to have lunch with you today. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I think uh, to uh, extend off of what uh, Danielle has already shared with you, I think it's important for us to remember that prior to COVID and the pandemic and the closures of our schools, there was a very um, active Red for Ed movement. There was uh, the teacher voice was resonating uh, across the country in states resonating in our state. And um, there, was, there was a very um, effective movement um, among uh, teachers in particular to uh, advocate for, for um, their salaries and for functions at schools. And then that all came to a halt with COVID. Um, I think there's a reemergence of that voice. And I think the, uh, one of the challenges in addition to what Daniela shared with you, and those are the, um, I think the, very specific challenges that we're seeing in districts up and down the state. Um, there's um, certainly there's a voice of the public that follows union behaviors um, closely and might not um, be uh, favorable toward uh, salary increases, if you will. Right? There's that that slice of the voice, but I think in in the world of education. Um, people are very sympathetic to what teachers have faced over the last couple of years. So specific to your question, Naj, about the pandemic, I think people are glad their schools are open, their children are back in school. I think we've heard many, many discussions about social emotional well-being of our children, of our staff members. And so our world is a world of relationships, right? And and ultimately, if, if labor relations aren't healthy, um, at any particular point going to get really contentious and take it to the public as we're seeing um, a, a, a reality is that this, uh, the sympathy vote will go to, to the people who are on the front line and that's our teachers, our custodians and so forth. So th those are, those are age old dynamics, but they're um, very exaggerated by what we've gone through with the pandemic. Danielle, thank, thanks for joining us um, today. W one question, I'm going to ask you a question because you're the expert that I've been getting all week long as, as a, a parent here, community manager in Sac City. And obviously we talked about the high profile strike that's happening. So there's a disagreement, right? They go, they go to strike and then there's some back and forth. One question we got in all week is how come, why does it take so long? Why, you know, why once they hit that mark, why, why don't they literally lock the parties in you know, in the room 24 seven until there's an agreement. And even I, I think some of our members who haven't been in a negotiations, maybe don't really understand that parents definitely don't understand that. So take us behind the curtain for a little bit. Like, how does this play out? And why does this become so drawn out in some cases? Well, wow, that's a very easy question, Edgar. Thank you for throwing a softball today at the legislative lunch break. I, I, <laughs> uh, geez, you know, it's, Tara Lynn mentioned something that's really important um, to think about as, as we discuss these very, very difficult situations um, and relationships matter and, and they're everything. And that is an overarching factor as we consider this entire discussion. And it, it's the relationship and the communication, keeping in mind that it's been a long journey to, to this point, there's been a lot of interactions, a lot of discussions about the issues. Every 
fact finding, every labor dispute has its own story. The issues are all not the same. The communication interactions are not the same. The relationships are not the same. And so I just want to note how incredibly difficult this is for all parties, including the students, the school communities, um, labor and districts um, or LEAs once they get to this point. I'm not there. I don't know what's happening um, behind the scene, but once you get to the fact finding process and procedure, the parties are interacting, they're communicating, sometimes they're actively engaged in the same room. In other instances, they may be doing research, calculating, analyzing, and you know, figuring out how to resolve the issues that are at hand. The other thing that I want to note is that whatever the issues are that are being discussed by both parties, um, they're all connected to everything else. So if you have collective bargaining agreement language that you're negotiating, it impacts other employment factors, other things. And so as the parties are working at those issues, it's not just so simplified. And everything, of course, has a tremendous cost when we're talking about salaries and different staffing configurations, as I mentioned earlier. And so it's all very complicated. Negotiations, bargaining, it's a process. And when people are forced um, to come to an agreement, that also puts extra pressure um, on the party. So I'm sorry I couldn't be more clear in terms of, you know, <laughs> hey, this is what's happening. This is what I think is happening. But I know that both are working very, very hard um, to get to a resolution. I am certain that nobody is pleased with the disruption to instruction. And that's that's the short-term impact, but I also want to note that when you have a significant job action, such as a strike, it impacts the school community for years to come. It yeah. sometimes may take them years to recover. If, if it changes the culture forever, um, which also disrupts, disrupts culture, disrupts instruction on the long-term. And that relationship factor that Tara Lynn talked about um, is also tremendously impacted. I uh, want to remind you folks, if you have a question for uh, for Danielle or Terlin, go ahead and put those uh, into our, our chat. Richard, I see the question that you've uh, just posted, so we'll get to that uh, coming up in just a couple of moments. Um, uh, Terlin, let me ask you about this, because you mentioned um, the, the stories for the teachers and for the students. You know, it's a, it's a little bit closer to the parents out there. It's a little bit easier, I, I guess we could say, to, to talk about you know, that story. Um, you've worked in districts where the districts have really struggled sometimes in telling their perspectives about negotiations, telling their stories. Um, it's a tough job for the districts to be able to do that. That is that is clear. What advice do you have for district leaders and what are some of the valuable practices when it comes to being able to communicate the message out to the public? A uh, terrific question and um, start early and that doesn't mean the day before you go to the table. Um, negotiations is wrought with, um, uh, just uh, marbled with um, inside insider uh, baseball language, jargon, we call it the J90 <laughs> language. Um, and I so I wanna start by looking at critical audiences and communication that will help you with negotiations. And it, it begins long before you are at the table. Just helping your board understand negotiations process, not in a drive-by and closed session one week before you're gonna sunshine, but in a governance training, especially if in this November you're gonna have new board members. You wanna sit down and I've watched superintendents do this tag the close of their governance training where we're working through agenda planning and all other topics that, that are touched on in, in governance training to, to really help the, um, especially the newer board members, but not only understand the negotiations process. And I am not kidding you when I say we cannot um, underestimate the importance of your board understanding how you move from sunshine to the table, what impasse means, what does fact finding mean, there, there's a lot to unpack in that, and there's a lot to unpack that, um, that and clarify for board members, again, before you're at the table, 
that will help them? What is 1%? What is a 1% increase in dollars? What is stirs and purrs? What is step and column? All of this language, unless you are familiar with this work, unless you're John Gray or you're Edgar Zazueta and you, you live it all the time, it's a, it's a fire hose on a new trustee and it's difficult for the board. So I think the first thing you want to do is make sure that you've walked through the negotiations process and you have your board fully informed so that they can set clear direction. You want to then as you move um, closer to negotiations, you want to make sure that other audiences within your organization understand the process too. It, it doesn't need to be a five hour lecture. It doesn't even need to be a 30 minute presentation, just an overview of the process and what it looks like. And I will say with your board and also your site administrators, I think we assume that people understand what the process looks like, why it's time consuming. As Danelle just said, you know, there's so much going on behind the scenes. It's not like people are just throwing up their arms and headed home. I don't believe for a minute there isn't one person involved in Sac City who doesn't want this to be settled and settled now. But it helps us as the internal um, um, authorities within the organization if we can explain to the public what the process looks like. So I think to start early, Naj, and, and to answer your specific question about communication, often what I see is the discussion about communication right before we're going to the table. What is it going to look like? Or even after we're at the table and it's been going fine and we, we fall back on this age-old practice of, okay, we'll start to communicate when things get bumpy. Too late. Too it's late. just really too late. And ours is a, a, a business of relationships again. So think about those committees that exist where before the committee disbands, it might be your parcel tax oversight committee, it might be your equity committee, just before they disband, a quick overview of what negotiations looks like in public education, not in our district, in all districts. What is the rhythm of that work? And that we will be going to the table sometime in months out, right? So you're not trying to influence negotiation, you're just seeking to inform your publics. I, I think that that's kind of been a missing ingredient for a while, and that's our big challenge moving forward. I also wanna make one last point about communication. And this is a personal philosophy, and this comes from a person who has a very sensitive heart for educators, I think we all do. Um, I, I do not subscribe to or prescribe the scorch the earth approach to communication because at the end of the day, we all have to go back and as Danielle said, you gotta recover, you gotta heal. There's no divorce here. So I really think the truth in common language, nobody knows what deferred maintenance is. When we talk about stores, other stores, uh, people don't know what that language means. So I think you have to be really sensitive to um, your presentation. Mm -hmm. Danielle, I'm going to ask you another easy softball question. I'm going to have you predict what, what you know what, what's to come, which I know you folks always love doing. So obviously, we, we know that the state budget, and we saw Dan's question there, but we'll get into some of the specifics of predictions of COLA and whatnot. But I think it's anticipated that there's going to be more revenues at May Revise. So with that, there's going to be more available resources. We don't know if those are one time. We don't know if those are ongoing. But just to get your perspective on how do you think that's going to impact negotiations moving forward. And I, we did have a question from Richard, which I'll, I'll try and see if you have any perspective on that. Uh, he, he wanted to know that his understanding that minimum wage could be tied to CPI, consumer price index, and basically the question, how should they be thinking about budgeting for minimum wage employees? So just some perspective of what's to come. Okay, so um, yeah, you're right. Another softball. So I'll start with minimum wage. <laughs> um, so we've hit we've hit our limit in terms of the minimum wage increase. The minimum wage can be increased through this CPI calculation um, that I think the Department of Labor provides, and I believe it's it can exceed three and a half percent each year. Um, we're actually doing some background information um, research into the minimum wage at school services and how we um, forecast that they this may impact. But here's what we know when we think about minimum wage. And I'm gonna tie this to the staffing shortage because I'm gonna put on my HR hat for a minute here. We know we have the staffing shortage. We know that we're struggling, especially with classified employees. Um, we don't wanna always and forever chase that minimum wage 
um, for some of our nutrition employees or paraprofessional employees or whomever. So I think that we should definitely prepare um, and budget for minimum wage increases in the future. And this can also be done through the legislative process as well. Um, and so we'll see if, or special ballot initiatives, there's other ways. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the future, but we definitely have our eyes on this. There is a formula with the California Department of Labor, and I think it can't exceed three and a half percent. It's very specific. Um, and I know that there's some folks on our team um, at School Services who are mathing this out. As I mentioned, I'm an HR person and I don't math things out. When I start doing that, then you should run for the hills. So <laughs> I'll say that about that. Now, I um, want to tie back to this communication concept that Tara Lynn was just talking about. And, and don't forget, she also mentioned Red for Ed, which, by the way, is a master communication plan um, on the national level by, by labor, right? Um, but when we talk about some of the revenues that we're expecting to see in the May revise, how complicated it already is as we try to communicate um, the COLA that we're expecting and the one-time temporary emergency funds that of course are finite and are going to be expiring at their respective levels, it makes things very complicated. When we're communicating out to our school, communicate, school communities, communicating during negotiations, it's important to do that with numbers, not percentages. So if we're just talking about 2%, that doesn't sound like a very high number, but if 2% for you is $6 million ongoing, that's an important factor in the context of the conversation to help bridge that understanding in terms of how school finance works and how things like salary increases and additional um, adding additional positions may impact the bottom line and the budget. And so that's important for communicating out, but then also doing, you know, interacting and engaging at the bargaining table. So um, things are already difficult now in terms of you know, factoring in the COLA, factoring in um, some of the funding that districts or LEAs currently have. And so if we have that additional coming in, it's going to be just as just as um, challenging. But we must also keep in mind there's already demands on much of that funding, especially if an LEA is experiencing declining enrollment. We can't we can't forget those two words and all this um, because that's going to significantly impact how um, COLAs and different funding sources will be utilized. I have one last question uh, for both of you to get some final opportunity, to get some final thoughts. We'll start with Tara Lynn. You know, so one, I, I saw David Garcia asked a question about situations where the where both sides couldn't come to an agreement and then independent negotiators had to come in if there's any precedent for that and whether that would settle a binding agreement. So you could touch on that if, if, if relevant. Uh, and then also just some final thoughts, trying to end on a positive note, because I think it was Danielle who said this. Negotiations don't always get attention, especially when they're going well, right? In, mm -hmm. in districts when there is a positive relationship. And you see a lot of that, too, right? I know both of you see those relationships across the state. So maybe if you could touch on some of the variables. And both of you have talked about this on the communication side. But what are the ingredients, if you will, that kind of lead it, that you have found in those districts? where they have had positive relationships and they've been able to circumvent the worst of, of this. Um, yeah. Carolyn, let's start with you. Well, if you, you hit it. It's relationships. Um, they have positive relationships um, and respectful relationships. Um, I see in districts where there's really um, healthy um, negotiations process, it doesn't become, you know, uh, contentious and, and, and taken to the public that, Often, not always, and there's no recipe here that's certainly no one size fits all, as we all are, are very much aware. But um, often there's this wonderful collaborative relationship with labor leaders and with employees. There's, and so, I mean, there are issue spotting together. They're talking about how to roll out late start, how to dive into ethnic studies, safety, well being. They're doing that together. Um, and so they work from that relationship. Also, this, uh, typically what I see in districts where negotiations will move through smoothly, there's a lot of support for site leaders and site leaders are very informed of what the negotiations process is. And again, I wanna come back to this. 
don't kid yourself, not all site leaders know what 1% is and not all site leaders even understand that the board sets the direction for negotiations because typically the CBO and the superintendent become sort of the, the pin cushion for negotiations. So they think it starts there. So all of that backgrounding um, in, in your um, opportunities to communicate with those internal audiences, but for the most part, I will say in the, in, communities and the cultures that I find where there's really healthy negotiations process. Um, there is a deep level of respect for all of the employees, um, the, the labor leaders, they are collaborative with those labor leaders and the board of education also is deeply connected to the community um, present in, in its work. And so there's, there's that real, this sort of people believe people right? Less what they read and more the people. So if, if you have those um, connections, um, you're, I find that you're usually in a better spot. It, I do think it's going to be a very bumpy November, and I think it would be a very wise um, for uh, superintendents in particular to be thinking about governance training and that time with their board so they can really walk them through um, all of these themes. And I say that as a former trustee and tell you that any trustee will tell you it takes a couple years to really get your sea legs. And if the first thing you're hit with is COVID and then the next thing you're hit with is difficult negotiations, you, you really need, um, you need some more time with your, um, with your superintendent on these things. So those are my overall observations. I wish I had a, uh, I think Danielle and I would love to hand you a silver um, bullet here, but we don't, or a magic recipe, but we don't, we don't have it. <laughs> Danielle, what would you add? Well, I'd, I'd add a different perspective from being someone who has been on the front lines, served on bargaining teams, been a chief negotiator um, for districts. I've been there in bad times. I've been there in, I, w I don't know, good times, but productive times. Um, I think there are many LEAs out there who are experiencing successful negotiations. Many are starting to move towards a more interest-based bargaining model, which is it takes time, it takes investment, it takes commitment from both parties. So if just the district has an interest and labor does not agree, it won't work. Um, but many are experiencing productive negotiations and bargaining. And don't forget that so many um, LEAs throughout our state successfully bargained um, the effects of the pandemic and employment conditions during the last couple of years. So there's been a lot of a lot mm -hmm. of success out there. As um, someone who also has been deeply involved in labor relations, which I believe what happens at the table formally during negotiations is completely influenced by what occurs the 90 percent other time, right? The day-to-day -day interactions. And one of the one of the attendees um, posted earlier, it begins with trust. It indeed does. And it's about building that trust through responsiveness, through clear communications, and through building these common interests. You don't have to agree on everything. You might not agree on anything, but how can you find a way um, to be productive outside of those formal bargaining sessions. So when you get in there, um, you know, it's not so hard. And then the last thing that I'll add is sometimes we have very positive relationships at the local level, but should regional representatives come in um, from CTA or maybe CSCA, um, that's always that third party present at the table very commonly may impact and influence how those communications go and also the relationship. Danielle Connolly from School Services of California, Terrilyn Fenders from F3 Law. Uh, Danielle and Terrilyn, it's been an honor to have you here on the show. Thank you so much for being with us, and we look forward to talking with you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Edgar, let me go back to uh, Daniel Figpen, our uh, good friend over at uh, San Juan Unified. He asked a two-part question, and I know you were trying to refer to it um, a, a little bit earlier, but let me see if we can get a little bit more clarification. He asked... Um, are we expecting COLA to come in higher in the May revise? And two, what are we hearing about uh, Assembly Member Phil Ting's LCFF bill 
uh, the 10% increase in base in lieu of COLA? What, what can we tell Daniel and the rest of our viewers? Yeah, the short answer is yes. We should expect a higher COLA. Like where that number is going to land, I think is a moving target. And I, I would cite it, but I'm probably going to mess up the number. But the LAO, I refer to folks, the LAO projection uh, did cite a higher COLA than what the governor uh, uh, announced in January. And that could also be different than what the governor uh, announces in May. But the short answer is we are expecting that the COLA would go up. Now, where some of these efforts, uh, Dan talks about this, uh, this, this proposal to increase the base amounts in lieu of COLA. Some of these are statutory COLAs. So I think that's some pieces that there would be, have to be changes in law. Uh, but this bigger question about where the money's going to go, it's frankly going to be one of our big emphasis for Ledge Action Day. It's one of our talking points to put more dollars into the base. I think at last count, there was $6 billion above the projections. That's a lot of money. They're going to have to invest a lot of that in schools. Um, so investing in the base grant, I think there is some appetite for that. I think that's one of the big pieces that the policymakers will be talking about. Can we divert more dollars to LCFF? So there's more to come on that front, but I think there will be some movement there. Okay. Uh, a reminder for folks, uh, next week uh, on our live and interactive AXA legislative lunch break Wednesday, uh, we will have Senator John Laird from District 17 here with us. And then on April 13th, our other regularly scheduled AXA legislative lunch break, Dr. Richard Pan will be here April 13th to talk about his proposed vaccination legislation. A reminder, uh, legislative action days, April 4th and 5th. Uh, be like Lester Powell, Megan Smith, and Angela Schull, who all registered during the show today. Register for Legislative Action Days. If you didn't hear the rundown of guests, uh, it is a uh, an, an incredible group of guests from the state capitol. A lot of decision makers, lawmakers are going to join us uh, April 4th and 5th, all virtual. Um, Edgar, I know you're excited about that event. Um, it, it should be a good one. This This one, I think, even if it, even though it's virtual, is going to be even more powerful than we have experienced last year and so many years before that. Yeah, like we said, we'll get back to the in-person event. We know that that has its disadvantages, but the, the advantage of virtual is we're making it accessible to more folks. And, and I think that's the goal. And I think we're going to accomplish that. And I think it'll be a good event, not only with the speakers again, but it's really the opportunity of our folks to utilize that inherent influence that they have. So it, it, please join us if you can. Uh, if, if, I think there'll be something to take away, but frankly, it's an opportunity to have our voices heard. Yep. And I'll add Tiffany Dietz to that list. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Look at that. You got a handful. You, you, yeah. you went a little overtime today, maybe because you took the week off last week, yeah. but I, I think it was worth it. You, you, you got us a few more attendees. Listen, I had plenty to say. And when you have a list of attendees, that's like that, that long, uh, you have a lot to say. Uh, Edgar, good seeing you. Uh, see you Monday for a uh, legislative action day starting at 9 a.m. Register uh, for that streaming activity. And folks, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll see you Monday. And of course, we'll see you Wednesday, uh, 1 p.m. live and interactive here on AXA Facebook and AXA YouTube. Have a great rest of the day and we'll see you on Monday.